Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Allied Physicians Group Mental Health Committee CME lecture. To start us off tonight, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lashley. Dr. Lashley is a great pediatrician here at Allied Physicians Group and also the chair of our Mental Health Committee. Uh, welcome, Dr. Lashley. Thank you so much, um, uh, Margaret, and I'm very excited about tonight's lecture. Um, uh, for those of you who uh, tried to log on earlier this evening, we apologize. We have some technical issues, but not to worry. Um, as we always do, we, we're going to we, this lecture was obviously recorded, and you'll be able to watch it in its entirety. Um, uh, we have a lecture series. Um, we have four mental health lectures per year, and um, Dr. Carlson is our third of the year, uh, and we're very excited to have her. Um, she has been the professor of psychiatry and pediatrics and the director of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the State University of New York at Stony Brook since 1985. She founded and directed the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry until 2013. Dr. Carlson specializes in childhood psychopathology and psychopharmacology in general, and the subjects of childhood and adolescent depression and bipolar disorder specifically. Um, I'm going to uh, mention that I'm, I'm annotating her bio because it is extensive. Um, she has an illustrious career where she's written over 300 papers and co-authored two books. And um, uh, she is uh, now in a, her presidential initiative and has been on impairing emotional outbursts, uh, what they are, who has them, and what can be done about them. So I'm uh, very excited to uh, have you talk with us, Dr. Carlson. Please take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for the screw up. Um, turns out that the uh, my link was sent to the wrong address. And uh, so the Zoom people said, she's a stranger, we're not going to let her in, and we're very successful in doing so. So we decided to record this instead. And so I will be um, open. Uh, the, the part you won't be able to do is ask me questions at the end. But if you want to email me, um, my email address is there at the front of the slides, gabrielle.carlson at stonybrook.edu. I will do the best I can to answer them. So I'm going to be talking, the, the original title of this was Emotion Dysregulation and Outbursts in Children. We had that title about a year ago, um, and I decided to focus more specifically on disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, where did it come from and what can we do about it? Sort of a more clinical talk, and I think that's probably more what you're interested in than the uh, research that's going on in irritability. My disclosures are I get research funding from NIMH and I get an honorarium for this presentation. So I'm gonna start out with a case example. I think that always makes things more relevant to people and I'm going to tell you about Zeke who was in sixth grade. He'd been suspended from school because he threatened to kill his teacher when she didn't help him fast enough with a math problem. Um, he had been having outbursts with minimum provocation since first grade. Um, he had been diagnosed with uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in first grade. The uh, provider had given him a, a small dose of methylphenidate I switched it to long-acting orosmethylphenidate, uh, and that he had been on unchanged until sixth grade. Uh, the parents had been in a contentious divorce back when he was in first grade. Uh, that was felt to be the cause of his problems, and so he was sent to therapy. In second grade, he was given an IEP with other health impairment as the, uh, as the diagnosis. Uh, however, he was given only resource room for his accommodations. After this threat, the disruptive mood dysregulation disorder diagnosis was made. The provider added guanfacine one milligram and then aripiprazole five milligrams to the orosmethylphenidate, but the outburst continued. Uh, Zeke was remorseful about his impulsive statements. He really didn't have a history of violence, but his threats were so blood curdling, they were terrified of him. And so they basically suspended him from school and asked for a psychiatric evaluation. So the point of this lecture is going to be to understand the history of why we got interested in the subject of irritability, to describe the phenomenology of outbursts, 
to review differential diagnosis and outcome and treatment. So let's start off with the definition of irritability. Irritability is a proneness to anger. It's a feeling. You feel like I was feeling with this stupid Zoom thing, right? Irritable. Um, there's lots of good reasons people are irritable. And um, if you're uncomfortable for some reason, like you're hot or your Zoom isn't working or your plane is late, you can be you know, annoyed at that point. It becomes pathological when the feeling is sustained and the manifestations are destructive. And that brings us to the impairing emotional outbursts, which are developmentally inappropriate displays of anger or distress manifested verbally with either rages and insults or uncontrolled crying or behaviorally with physical aggression towards people, property, or yourself. They're grossly out of proportion in frequency, intensity, and duration to the situation or provocation and lead to significant functional impairment. Now, not all irritability ends in emotional outbursts and not all outbursts occur in the context of irritability. Um, I was having a discussion with a friend of mine about the obituary of Bobby Knight that was in the New York Times last week. Uh, he certainly sounds like he had temper outbursts. I don't know if he was chronically irritable. I'm not a close enough fan of his to be able to say, but I think there are a lot of athletes who blow off steam and, and uh, have emotional outbursts, and they're not necessarily irritable. So it's an important distinction to make people who just get grouchy people who have outbursts and people who do both. And we're gonna be talking about the latter today. So irritability, anger, aggression, and outbursts overlap. They are the term that everybody throws around these days are transdiagnostic. And I put up the diagnoses that most often are associated with the irritable mood and the outbursts. So we've got disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, which I'll tell you about as we go along. Post-traumatic stress disorder has irritability and outbursts among its criteria. Uh, conduct disorder, intermittent explosive disorder have at least outbursts, not necessarily associated with irritable mood. There are several things where just irritable mood are noted, and uh, that's basically anxiety and depression or borderline personality disorder, or oppositional defiant disorder. But ironically enough, for at least child and adolescent mental health folks, the most common, the most common conditions associated with irritability, anger, and outbursts don't have them as a criterion, okay? So that's ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, and Tourette's disorder. So where did DMDD come from? Well, it's got a long and winding road history. For those of you whose uh, profession goes back prior to 1980, basically, when the DSM-3 was born, anyway, the old conceptualization of the hyperkinetic child syndrome had many of the symptoms of ADHD, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and distractibility, but it also recognized an emotional component. Fits of anger easily provoked reactions of volcanic intensity, and fluctuating, the kid's unpredictable. Sometimes he's good and sometimes he's bad. Those symptoms did not make it into DSM-3. However, what did make it into DSM-3 and beyond are those symptoms all under the rubric of mania and bipolar disorder. So the brain doesn't really care about our diagnosis and our nomenclature. Those things go together in the brain what we call them is man-made, okay? So we decided, eh, not ADHD? Oh, look at that. It's maybe it's bipolar disorder. So what happened was, if you don't include something in the criteria, it doesn't get asked about in all the studies. It get, got resurfaced as juvenile mania, the defining characteristics of which were chronic severe outbursts, not episodes. So it was chronic severe outbursts on top of ADHD-like symptoms. The DSM-5 improved the mania criteria so that there wasn't quite so much of an overlap and created a new disorder to keep TIDS from being diagnosed falsely with bipolar disorder and being given atypical antipsychotics. It was a shameless um, um, manipulation 
it was not really ready for prime time, but the committee folks really were concerned about the number of kids with outbursts who were being given bipolar disorder diagnoses that they didn't really have. Well, as I like to tell my students with 2013 DSM-5 DMDD, it isn't like a whole bunch of new kids came down from Mars or outer space or something like that that we'd never seen before. This is old wine and new bottles. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at the kids that got diagnosed with DMDD or severe mood dysregulation, which was what it was called in the research nomenclature, what you see is four-fifths of those kids had ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder. They also had internalizing symptoms many times, more frequently anxiety than depression. But this is a highly comorbid condition with ADHD and ODD being the most common diagnoses that uh, are there uh, underneath it. So we've got ADHD and ODD in kids with disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. And if we turn that on its head and look in the general population, you'll find that in fact, there are a lot of kids who've got irritability and dysregulation occurring in ADHD. So it goes both ways. Um, and that's in a general population sample in a specific ADHD sample. Uh, up to 75% of the kids had some level of irritability, low frustration tolerance, dysregulation. Uh, and if you look at Russ Barkley's clinic sample, who he thought, you know, he diagnosed really well when they were kids, followed them up with a comparison community sample when they were adults, you'll see that compared to the community adults, two thirds to three quarters of those people with adult ADHD continued to have this dysregulation, overreact emotionally, quick to anger, easily frustrated. So this is a very common symptom in ADHD and it persists. So what else do we know about DMDD criteria? Well, my criteria to remember it is OIVE, um, which is the way many people felt about it when they saw it. But I have an easier time remembering criteria if I've got an acronym, like my acronym for ADHD is HIDE, which is what you want to do with those kids. Hyperactivity, impulsivity, distractibility, and emotion dysregulation. And my criteria for DMDD is OIVE, and the O is for outbursts, which are frequent, impairing, and in more than one place, which is important. This isn't just the kid that doesn't get along with his third grade teacher. He's having trouble at home, in school, in Boy Scouts, in Girl Scouts, whatever. I is for irritable mood when not having outbursts. This isn't just outbursts when you don't get your way. These kids are grungy and irritable, and they have outbursts in addition. It's chronic, it's lasted at least a year. It's not explained better by another condition like mania or depression or PTSD or autism. That is to say, you can have some of those, well, you can't have depression along with the MDD or mania, but you can have autism or anxiety. But if basically the kid is anxious, it isn't necessary to give him another diagnosis. The point is that outbursts can occur in many conditions that need to be ruled out. And the why is for young. It starts in childhood after age six and before age 10. Now, we know in medicine that there is a difference between symptoms and disorder, okay? DMDD, we're talking about a disorder. It's got criteria. It says who has it, who doesn't have it, et cetera, et cetera. Outbursts are a symptom or a sign. It's a, it's, um, they're, they're a common reason for help seeking rather than grumpy mood. I will tell you, having worked in emergency rooms and on inpatient units for many years, I cannot think of all the years that I've been at work that anybody called the police or rushed their child into an inpatient unit because he was grumpy. That's not where the impairment is. The impairment is the outbursts. Now, keep in mind, outbursts are more common than a diagnosis. So. 18% of preschool kids will have significant tantrums or outbursts. 10% of 6 to 12-year-olds will have outbursts. 5% uh, of teens may have outbursts. 
but the diagnosis of DMDD, which has the frequency and the rule ins and the rule outs, et cetera, is much less common. So about 3% in children, less than 1% in teens. It's highly comorbid, as I've already told you, high rates of ADHD, anxiety, and depression. The diagnosis may come and go. Okay, people say, well, it's an unstable diagnosis, meaning you get a diagnosis now, in two years, will you continue to have the diagnosis? The answer is probably not. But it doesn't mean the problem goes away. The diagnosis may be unstable, but the symptoms are quite stable. So here's one case of a kid uh, in, in a sample, normal sample, 9.3% of them had DMDD-like symptoms at baseline, about 6% of them had it at follow-up, only 3% had it at both times, but 30% of them had significant symptoms at follow-up. And a similar study, this time with a recruited uh, dysregulated sample, by definition, 100% of them had it at ba baseline. By the two-year follow-up, about half of them still met full criteria the other half of them were subthreshold. So symptoms don't necessarily go away, but you may not meet all the criteria. What happens to this grown up? Well, it hasn't been around long enough for us to do a follow up study of kids with freshly diagnosed DMDD. So, what people have done is they've taken their studies where they've got a population of kids that have been followed up in adulthood, and they've looked back. And they've said, hmm, can I recreate a sample of kids that might have had DMDD when they were kids? And we've got the answer to the question, right? We, we, we have, if this were a mystery story, we knew who, we'd know who the murderer was at the beginning of the story. We know what happens to the kids at the end. We have to find who might, became, might have become them at the beginning. So DMDD retrofitted into childhood data, refer, re reveal, that of those kids that somebody thought had DMDD as adults, they had significantly higher rates of dysthymia, depression, and anxiety, all those internalizing symptoms. What they don't have is bipolar disorder, okay? So for the question of whether this was mania or bipolar disorder in disguise, you would have expected some degree of bipolarity to turn up in the samples, and they did not, okay? So no bipolar disorder. But if you're like me, you scratch your head and you say, huh, didn't that woman just tell me that the symptoms are quite stable? Didn't Russ Barkley find two thirds of his ADHD kids ended up having much more volatility than the controlled sample? What is this? Well, what it is is, in case it didn't cross your mind or your life, there's a big difference between a community sample of kids and kids who knock on your door because they have significant behavior problems. So if you take the top two to 5% of irritable kids who are the ones that knock on my door in clinic, the top two to 5%, they continue to have problems with aggression. They continue to have problems with dysregulation. They don't necessarily develop antisocial behavior which brings into mind the other caveat in the studies that people do. And that is, you know, for many years, and, and this is where I made my reputation, people didn't think children got depressed because nobody asked the kids how they felt. Okay, they didn't ask them. And so, no, don't ask, don't tell. Well, the same thing goes on with adults with childhood disorders. So all of the studies that I told you about, which find uh, depression, anxiety, etc. they don't ask about childhood psychopathology. They don't ask, well, does this kid still have ADHD? Does this kid, you know, grown up now as a 24-year-old? Do they have oppositional defiant disorder? Those questions aren't asked. And even if they're asked, they don't do what we do in pediatrics or child psychiatry. We don't, we get another informant. We don't just ask the kid, we ask the parent. Well, when you have a 24-year-old in a study, you don't ask their parent or their spouse, but you probably should, because these are symptoms. These are 
garlic symptoms. They bother other people, whereas onion symptoms bother them. And so you really do need another informant. All right, so just to refresh your memory then, irritability is proneness to anger. It has an internalizing or tonic component. Kid is easily annoyed, easily angered, stays angry, gets angry often, is cranky and grumpy. On follow-up, the internalizing component becomes anxiety and depression. But there is the externalizing component that the people call phasic irritability or outbursts. And that's what the child does when he's irritable. He yells and screams and threatens and has tantrums and he damages things and may hit, kick and spit. It's measured with aggression scales and on follow-up, those kids continue to have problems with temper control. So what's the differential diagnosis of explosive outbursts? Well, if they're rare, then the child doesn't have DMDD by definition, probably does not have bipolar disorder. He may have something called intermittent explosive disorder, all of which basically means is occasionally the person blows up. If the outbursts are frequent, then the next cut is, is this a change in behavior from the child's usual self? Okay, you know, he used to be such a nice kid since he started third grade, or he used to be, or she used to be such a nice kid. And, you know, since we moved to Tennessee, it's, it's, it's different. So then the next cut is, is it a child? And if it's a child, then you need to rule out stressors or trauma, or learning problems in school or being bullied by peers or significant family problems or abuse at home. Sometimes somebody will discontinue ADHD medications. Um, kid might have an anxiety disorder. If it's an adolescent, then more likely you're looking at a mood disorder like mania or depression or anxiety disorder. And now drugs and psychosis rear their ugly heads. If the outbursts are chronic as opposed to a change from the person's usual self and they're chronic, then the question is, are they irritable between outbursts? Are we talking about a kid who's chronically irritable and having explosive outbursts? If that's the case, then that's a DMDD diagnosis. If it turns out the kid is just fine, thank you very much, his mood is just fine, and you frustrate him, or he's defiant and oppositional, then you're dealing with something like ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder. And in any of those circumstances, the kid could also have autism. So what do we do about this? Well, first thing you need to do is evaluate it. And the way I think about it is as, like, as a bomb, okay? So we have a bomb here. What lights the fuse is triggers. What is it that gets the kid to blow up? Is it is it, you know, he gets frustrated, he doesn't uh, get to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it? Is it um, shyness, and, and now you're putting him in, and I'm, I use a male pronoun, forgive me, I'm, I just ought to have it do that. Anyway, the kid gets um, put in a situation that makes him anxious, and anxiety is one of the things that can lead to outbursts. It could be somebody who's been traumatized and, and if they go past the place where their car accident was, which was traumatic, they might have a trigger and, and get get agitated under those circumstances. Uh, if, the, if the child has autism and you change things on him and he's not prepared for the change, you might get an outburst. So those triggers are important. The length of the fuse is important. That's what the tonic irritability is. How emotionally reactive is this kid? How easily is that fuse lit? And then, of course, after you figure that out, the next thing is, is how bad does it get when the kid explodes? Are you talking about somebody that just flips you a, a middle finger and stomps out of the room? Or are you talking about somebody where you have to call the police because they're so out of control? So the size of the explosion is really important. And how long it lasts. So even if I hurl invectives at you rather than a piano bench, if I do it for just one second and, you know, say F you, that's very different than if I rant and rave and scream and yell and threaten for half an hour. So how long it lasts, how quickly I could recover from my upset is another piece of how you have to evaluate this dysregulation thing. 
Okay. I am a very, very strong proponent of getting rating scales. And there's two types of rating scales that I think are important. One that has norms that tell you how bad this child is in comparison to other children his or her age. And the other is more specific looking at what it is you're talking about. The usual things that people use for uh, normative data are things like the child behavior checklist, the ACEBA system, uh, child behavior checklist, or uh, teacher report form, um, in which case the things that have been studied most extensively with this as there are irritability items, um, there's a dysregulation profile, which is very elevated scores on anxiety, depression, attention, and aggression. The strength and difficulties questionnaire, if you've not ever encountered it, is a nice little system. It's one page long. It's available online for free. It's not nearly as detailed as the CBCL or the BASC or those kinds of things, but it's been studied quite extensively and it's got the right price. So for, for those of you who don't want to spring for something like the ACEBA system or the Connors or whatever, use the strength and difficulties questionnaires and have it has norms as well. And I have the Can Connors parent rating scale. I, I don't, by the way, get any money from any of these things, but I have used them for a long time. It's really useful to see whether when somebody complains about their child, they're in the 80th percentile, 90th percentile, or five standard deviations above the mean. Okay, if you want something more specific for irritability, the affect reactivity scale uh, developed by a guy named Arguris Stringeris about 10 years ago is a really nice trim little thing. It's got six items, not true, somewhat true, definitely true, and all of the irritability items, how easily annoyed is the person. And in general, a score of four or more is clinically significant. This is another nice little um, um, rating scale developed by Carla Masevsky, originally for autistic kids, but it works fine in, in um, non-autistic kids. And it looks, so, so the one I showed you before talks about temper tantrum, it talks about losing your temper, but not what you do when you lose your temper. Masevsky scale I like because it talks about outbursts, has explosive outbursts, stays angry for more than five minutes, can't calm down, emotions go from zero to 100 instantly, okay? Really nice uh, items like that that you rate from not at all to very severe. This is something I developed um, back in the early 2000s after um, I did some studies on our inpatient unit. It really was meant to be more of an interview screen than a rating scale. So it doesn't have norms to it. It wasn't intended to have score. But when I ask parents to fill stuff out before I see them, I have them get a CBCL, a child behavior checklist. I get information from the teacher. Um, I see how irritable the kid is in general. And this asks again, is the kid rarely irritable or often irritable? What are the child's triggers? What does the child do when they have a meltdown? And is it, you know, a little or a lot? How often does it occur? How long does it last? Is the child irritable between outbursts, et cetera? I can just glance at this and say, uh, this looks like the kid needs a little bit more work here in, in terms of the temper business. Or if it doesn't occur, it doesn't occur very often. I don't have to spend a lot of time on it. So it's a really nice screen. Um, for people who want to know how it stacks up, in general, a kid that's got more than four or more outburst behaviors, they occur more than weekly and last more than 30 minutes. They belong at least in my outpatient department. Um, if you want to get this emo eye, um, I will show you uh, how to get it at the end, but you can go to the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry website, ACAP dot org and in the search um, thingy put emotion dysregulation resource center and it gives you a bunch of articles on the subject a bunch of rating scales plus this and a parent medication guide which i'll tell you about in a minute in terms of treatment i'm going to go through this part fairly quickly because i'm going to make a point on this slide 
And that is, this is where the severity business becomes very important. Because if you look at the studies of ADHD and irritability, what you see is two things. First of all, when you treat the ADHD, and that's what has happened in this slide, that these are kids in the multimodal uh, treatment of ADHD study who had ADHD plus irritability dysregulation, what you see in this uh, slide over here is uncomplicated kids with ADHD, okay? They don't get dysregulated. That's what this dotted line is, is over the 95th percentile for dysregulation. Uncomplicated ADHD kids don't get dysregulated. They get calmer when you treat their ADHD, nice slope there over the 14 months of the study. The dysregulated kids, however, with their treatment have the same slope. They, they respond just as well. They start out sicker and they end up sicker, okay? So they are well over the 95th percentile when you start to treat them. They end up just under the 95th percentile. They're about the same level as these kids when they start treatment. So this tells you that um, our treatments for ADHD do a decent job, but they don't always work. The effect size, which is how robust the treatment is, is for combined treatment for these kids with AD, for the kids with irritability and dysregulation. If they had combined medication and good behavior modification, they improved a lot. Effect size of 0.8 is, is pretty good. Just behavior mod alone gave you an effect size of 0.4. Medication management alone gave you an effect size of 0.6. Um, if you look at my dysregulation profile, the effect sizes are actually even better there. So some effectiveness of treatment. This is even a better look at that question. This was a study more recently published. Um, we were participants at, um, at Stony Brook. A guy named Joe Blader said, I really want to look at kids who've got ADHD and aggression. And by aggression, he means impulsive aggression, not, not thugs, okay? So he brought the families in, gave the parents parent training, and he said, I'm going to try to get you as good as you can get on a stimulant medication. It took him several months to do that. This is not a slam, bam, thank you, ma'am kind of an intervention. It takes a while to do it. When he did half the sample got much better. Two thirds of them were on orosmethylphenidate, some were on other long acting things, 23% on amphetamine, but half the sample really got better. That's the good news. The bad news is the other half got somewhat better, but not better enough, okay? And so the point of his study was to add risperidone and valproate and placebo to the kids that didn't respond to stimulants alone. And so what he found was that there was a difference compared to placebo. So they work better than nothing, but they didn't work as well as with these kids with a stimulant response. So again, it's another way of my saying to you, stimulants are effective, but they're not always effective in everybody as well as we would, would like them to be. Um, this is another study looking at ADHD and aggression, um, the TOSCA study. It um, had a slightly different method, um, methodology. It didn't take, you know, three months to stabilize the kid in an optimal dose of, of stimulant. You got three weeks of stimulant plus, plus parent training. However good you were, that was what it was that got randomized to risperidone or not. So this is how impaired the kids were at, at the start. This, the black is whether they had just stimulant alone, and this is whether uh, they ended up with stimulant and uh, risperidone at the start. By the end of the study, you can see the kids on the combination, that they were both better. Kids on the combination were better than the kids on the stimulant alone. But unfortunately, a year later, there had been significant relapse. 
So it says most, but not all the ADHD and aggressive kids continue to have significant problems that one time medication and therapy didn't eradicate. No, duh, in my book, chronic problems need continued treatment. Other medications besides the stimulants that have been used are guanfacine, the alpha agonist, guanfacine and clonidine. Basically, they have been studied only in kids with ADHD. And the bottom line is, is if the ADHD improves with the alpha agonist, the aggression gets somewhat better. The problem is it takes four to six weeks before you see maximum change. And it's not quite the hallelujah chorus here. It's our usual 0.6 effect size, not bad. Um, but again, this is um, in addition, or that this is in the kids that are treated with um, the, whose ADHD responds to the alpha agonists. How about mood stabilizers? We got into this swamp because people thought, hmm, maybe these outbursts and, and the hyperactivity, impulsivity, distractibility, and emotionality, maybe that was a form of bipolar disorder. They didn't grow up to become bipolar, but let's see how they do on mood stabilizers. Well, the problem, of course, is that all the kids that were in the studies of quote unquote bipolar disorder had really high rates of ADHD and ODD. And what we learned was that divalproex or valproate or, uh, alone did not, was not terribly helpful. Lithium alone for severe mood dysregulation didn't beat placebo. Um, and probably the best study to sort of put it all together was the team study, which was uh, supposed to be looking at kids with bipolar disorder, 90% uh, of whom had ADHD and for whom ADHD was a moderator of poor response because P.S. those kids really didn't have bipolar disorder. So if you look at it, risperidone gave you the best amount of treatment. Two thirds of the kids were considered improved or very much improved on risperidone. About a third of them were considered improved or very much improved on lithium and order only a quarter were improved or very much improved on valproate. So you can see why people ended up using the um, um, atypicals. They're easier to use. You don't need blood levels, et cetera, et cetera. All they do is make you fat. So people were using these by the tons. How about antidepressants? Well, Dr. Carlson, you said these kids grow up to have anxiety and depression. Why not use antidepressants? So there have been two studies to do that. One of them using Listex amphetamine with added fluoxetine, another one using methylphenidate with added citalopram. The top study didn't show any gain with fluoxetine. The bottom study, depending on which rating you used, showed an improvement. So if you used the so called CGI scale, there was some improvement. If you, they didn't really use other measures, but looking at the description of what happened, it was not a huge response, okay? Here's the bottom line in any of these studies, and that is, I told you before that irritability and outbursts are transdiagnostic. What would have been nice would have been if the sample sizes, and it took a long time to get these samples, this is not easy work to do, but if they had a big enough sample so that they could have broken out the kids who had more anxiety and depressive type symptoms, those might have been the kids that showed a response as opposed to the more ADHD, ODD kids. So it may be that who you select to get which of the adjunctive medications makes a difference. And unfortunately, as I said, without knowing the severity of the sample, it was difficult to know how helpful the SSRIs were. So the medication algorithm that you want to sort of keep in mind is, again, remember that this stuff sort of came out of a bipolar tradition. If you've got a child who actually has mania or bipolar disorder, if they meet criteria for it, then you do have to stabilize their mood and then add ADHD medications afterwards if their ADHD symptoms don't go away. On the other hand, 
if they've got DMDD or ADHD and ODD with outbursts, optimize the stimulant medication, do parent training, and if the ADHD and outbursts respond, continue to do it. Okay, don't just say, okay, goodbye, you know, I'll send you a Christmas card. These kids continue to need treatment. Now, you may not have to see them every week, maybe once a month is enough, but they need continued oversight. If the ADHD improves, but the outbursts continue, then you're adding other mood or aggression treatments. If the ADHD gets worse, then you have to try non-stimulants and other kinds of things. These are really the toughest kids to treat. The other take home message that I want you to be aware of is often when you use stimulants and, and you, you've probably experienced this as a lot if you do any of this treatment, you start the medication, the next day you get a hysterical call from the mom, the medicine's making him understand. Okay. Well, what you need to do is remind the parent that you're not going to get anything overnight here. Okay, you're in here because he has outbursts. Don't expect it's going to stop immediately. That's number one. Number two, when are the outbursts occurring? The outbursts are occurring while the medication is working. Then it's a side effect and, and it's a problem on the medication. If what's happening is that the poor parent now gets the kid at night when the stimulant is worn off and he's terrible, then you're possibly dealing with rebound. And then your next question is, is, did the medicine work during the day? So is the teacher still complaining about the kid or is the teacher saying, gee, Johnny or Mary is much better during the day. You're picking up the pieces or the parent is picking up the pieces at night. That's a different kettle of fish. That's worth keeping the kid on and figuring out how to help the rebound rather than saying this isn't helping at all. We're gonna have to change our strategy. So ADHD and mood dysregulated kids are more symptomatic and impaired than those without mood dysregulation. Stimulants are often effective but need to be optimized and they may not do enough. Parent training helps, but in 44% of the MTA kids impaired by aggression, in spite of the best treatment, they, they still remain symptomatic. Data are inadequate for the non-stimulants. And combined stimulants and alpha agonists work a, a bit better than either alone for ADHD, but the aggression mood dysregulation hasn't been the focus of studies. There are a number of models for understanding mood dysregulation and impulsive aggression. There's the behavioral model, which is a coercive relationship between parent and child, where each of them inadvertently reinforces the wrong kids, perpetuating the wrong things, perpetuating the behavior. So the kid has a temper tantrum. The parent finally gives in after half an hour. The kid says, all right, I'm going to have to remember that half an hour for the temper tantrum. Or the parent gives the kid a slug and the kid shuts up. And the parent says, hmm, abuse works. I'm going to do this again. So that's a coercive relationship. Frustrative non-reward. These are kids who become aggressive when their goal is blocked. This is the paradigm that's being used by the folks at NIMH along with aberrant threat processing. That is to say, the child's amygdala perceives something as a threat. It really isn't, but that doesn't change how their brain is functioning. So a bump in the hallway or what they perceive as a dirty look or with little Zeke, the teacher not coming fast enough to help him when he wants, she, he, re, he interprets that as she doesn't like me, she doesn't wanna help me, I'm going to retaliate, okay? So his brain has misunderstood the fact that the teacher had to be helping somebody else had nothing to do with how she felt about him. Cognitive inflexibility or poor problem solving. This is the uh, Einstein theory, seeing only one help, unhelpful way of problem solving and doing it over and over, expecting a different response. And negative cognitive bias, attending to ambiguous situations and interpreting them as negative. So there are a number of psychotherapeutic interventions, parent management training, which I've mentioned, which really has the most data. There are some data for our CBT and anger management and collaborative problem solving, which is a way of, of using de-escalation techniques and, and sort of going with the kid's feelings, trying to help him cope with the frustration that he feels. 
a dialectical behavior therapy for teens with borderline personality disorder. MATCH is an approach that uses different kinds of psychotherapies for different kinds of problems, instituting the outbursts. And there's a whole bevy of new therapies that are being developed to be helpful. There's a, a childhood DBT. There's graduated exposure that I'll talk about in a minute to increasing frustration. And there's cognitive bias training, basically teaching the child how to look at faces and not interpreting them in, in a negative way. The exposure therapy for th uh, irritability is coming out of the NIMH, which combines basically anger management with exposure. The idea being, if I get upset because kids tease me, okay, then what I need to do is get used to being teased. And so in this paradigm, basically, you get the child to sort of talk about different levels of things that make the kid angry. And then you basically rehearse with him what he does when somebody calls him a, I don't know, fat slob or what, you know, says his mother wears army boots or whatever it is, <clears throat> excuse me, that gets him angry. He gets exposed to that frustration over and over and over again till he's able to manage it and, and so forth. It's kind of a nice paradigm. There's some preliminary data on it. The manual is available available from um, the folks at NIMH. If you're interested, you can write to me and I'll tell you how to get it. Um, a few years ago, a guy named James Waxmonsky did a sort of MTA type study with eight DMDD kids. He basically had a parent component of psychoeducation and behavior modification. The kids had a group that was supposed to teach him uh, coping skills. Um, the kid was stabilized or gotten given the best medication treatment possible, and the control comparison group was stabilized on medication but didn't get these therapies. And what happened basically was that there was clearly some improvement over the course of time. Here's our friend and effect size of between about 0.5 and 0.6. So not bad, but not fantastic. And as soon as they stop, back to square one again, okay? So this is a chronic problem. It needs chronic treatment. This is a plug for behavior modification, which we used to do on our children's inpatient unit. Uh, we had a really nice program of, of uh, behavior modification, of positive praise, parent training, rewards, et cetera. Uh, but it was deemed um, that we couldn't do that anymore. And so I took the opportunity of looking at the 10 years that we had our inpatient unit, 661 kids, and what this said to you was, is if the kid was hospitalized during a time where we had the behavior modification program, they had many fewer seclude, whoops, many fewer seclusion and restraints than they did when the behavior mod program was removed. Any kid could have just one seclusion, but two or more, again, you can see twice as many without the behavioral program. If you look at PRNs being given, same thing is true. Many more without the behavior modification program. So it really was a mistake taking that program away. Kids with these kinds of problems need to have some level of limits. They certainly need to have empathy. They need to know where the truth lies, but they really do need to have some limits. Uh, what about the outbursts in medication? Well, at least in the hospital, um, PRNs with IMs are frowned on because you need to jump on the kid and give him a needle. I mean, that really is like an assault. So it isn't pretty to look at. And honestly, the data in back of PRNs, IM, PRN medication is terrible. Where it's done is in emergency rooms. And in emergency rooms, you want to get the kid out of there. And so the kid may get better over the course of the time of the PRN, but, but you don't know whether that continues to be a problem when the kid leaves the emergency room. Plus, a parent can't whip out a needle and give the kid an IM. How about oral PRNs? Well, we've looked at those data and I'll get to them. The, the point basically was what we did is we looked, the nurses looked at how long the outbursts lasted after the PRN was given. 
We had other data that say unmedicated PRNs last about an hour. The mean is about an hour. The median is about 45 minutes. We looked at all the different oral PRNs that we gave the kid. We translated them into risperidone equivalents because that was just easier to do. And so basically the kids had gotten between 0.5 and one milligram of a PRN risperidone or risperidone equivalent. They were all on standing neuroleptics in a reasonably high dose. So kids were adequately medicated. Kids with more outbursts had longer outbursts, but ta-da, oral meds and natural outburst assistance were the same. If you look at this a survival analysis, what you're looking at is, is this is the median time to survival, 0.5. There it is at about 45 minutes. These are all the outbursts that got better in less than five minutes. I mean, less than five minutes, less than 45 minutes. These are all the outbursts that took more than 45 minutes to get better. And as you can see down here, there really wasn't any significant difference in the medications that got used. Actually, olanzapine did a little bit worse, but there was just no difference in these oral PRNs. So we give oral PRNs, it makes the nurses feel better, but I'm not convinced it does anything for the kids. What is interesting is for those kids that were on stimulant medications, those kids that were on extended release medications actually had somewhat shorter outbursts. They, they were shorter by about 20 minutes. So here you can see there's that survival analysis again, these are the extended release medic, uh, stimulants. These were the short acting stimulants. So there really was a difference between extended release and short acting medication. That doesn't mean you don't use the short acting ones. It means basically that for the kids that, <clears throat> that we had on the inpatient unit, once they got really stabilized on a good do dose of longer acting stimulant, their outbursts were shorter. Their outbursts didn't stop. You know, what you'd like to see is no outbursts, but anyway, it, they were somewhat shorter. So here's a summary now of what we know and what we need. So irritability is transdiagnostic. We don't know whether the nature of it changes with diagnoses. We don't know whether the anxious irritable kid is any different from the oppositional irritable kid, from the ADHD irritable kid. Do pay attention to the severity of irritability and what's being measured, the mood or the outbursts. Think of irritability like a fever. The higher the fever, the, the you, you can give the you know the kid a, a set, set of medicine or ibuprofen or whatever. The temperature is 105 and it goes down three degrees. Temperature still 102. Temperature is 102. It goes down three degrees. Kid is afebrile. So it's the same thing with irritability. It isn't clear whether it represents a normal, normally distributed temperamental trait, and these people are just two to and higher standard deviations, whether it's a severe form of a particular disorder, a separate disorder, the impact of neurodevelopmental issues or overwhelming stress, or all of the above. The median duration is a half, uh, half an hour in outpatients was about half an hour. 45 minutes for the sick kids. The more in sphere and persistent the symptoms are, the more likely they are to continue. The mood and triggers might be, the mood and triggers might be targets for psychological treatment and medication and behavior modifications might be useful for the outbursts. We need to optimize treatment for the primary disorder, if you know what that is, but many times it just isn't enough. This is what I, I said to you would be available on our ACAP website, acap.org. Parent medication guide is really nice. It goes through the medications you might be using in parent-friendly uh, language. Um, this is the couple of reviews that have been written on the subject. The uh, uh, emo I is on there. And our codes basically, probably not enough time for me to go into it, but it, this is probably something you don't even know about, but our codes are symptom codes in the ICD. And in my opinion, rather than giving somebody a diagnosis they don't have, you can use an R code to code the fact that they have irritability or outbursts or violent behavior. You could add that 
to a diagnosis the kid has, or you can just use the R code the way the medic medicine people do when they don't know what's wrong. But anyway, I never even knew those things existed. All right, two more things. What happened to our friend Zeke? We took him off his guanfacine, aripiprazole, and oros methylphenidate. He was titrated up on short-acting methylphenidate. He needed 15 milligrams twice a day. He'd been being five, five milligrams for six years, okay? He needed 15 milligrams twice a day, which was then converted to beaded methylphenidate, long-acting 30 milligram capsules. He worked much more efficiently. He was able to delay gratification and control his blurting out uh, threats and frustration. He was on home instruction. They would not take this child back to school. They were sure he was going to bring uh, uh, an AK, whatever the number is, in and shoot them all dead. And they would not let this child back in school. His home instruction teacher documented his improvement. We met with the school staff so that they understood the fact that this kid had not been being treated appropriately in all those years. He was basically untreated. We said, just let him back it gradually, you know, one or two periods. If he ends up being terrible, we'll have to find another alternative, but he's doing pretty well at home. After a month, he was back in school full time. He had done well academically and socially for the past year. More recently, he's needed a third dose of medication to be added at four o'clock. The provider was also instructed on the need to optimize ADHD treatment before adding other medications or assuming there was another cause for his behavior. The reluctance to treat him more vigorously was because everything was attributed to the fact that the parents were going through a divorce and this kid's uh, symptoms were due to the fact that he was being stressed by that. Well, the two things don't rule each other out. He could have been being stressed, but the fact remains he had ADHD and, and frankly not treating him almost ruined his life. All right, let me let me add, end on one of my favorite stories actually about pediatricians. Um, a mom came to see her pediatrician because her kid was having outbursts. <coughs> Excuse me and complained and you know tore, tore her hair she tried everything the pediatrician said okay the next time george has an outburst i want you to go into the bathroom get a cup of water put some in your mouth and swish it around in your mouth just swish it around in your mouth mother thought the pediatrician was nuts just humor me and do it she did it she came back in a couple of weeks and she said, I can't believe it. I can't believe how much better he is. How can swishing water around in my mouth make him better? And the pediatrician says, it's not the water being swished around. It's because you kept your mouth shut. And so the point is that there really are strategies to help manage the child's outbursts. And one of them is to not feed into them and make them worse. So on that funny note, I will formally end my talk. One, one of the best things that you said, that I thought you said, um, was that the brain doesn't care about our nomenclature. Mm -hmm. And it just struck such a chord uh, with me about how we, as pediatricians, often want to pigeonhole our patients into, you know, a diagnosis and, uh, it's a lot more nuanced usually. Um, what's going on and, and and trying to tease all that out, it, it's hard for us. And uh, it's, it's hard for us to spend the time to try to tease them out in, in our brief interactions with our patients. Um, it it but, is, and let me tell you that the, you, you, in our different professions, we, we complement each other. You have the advantage of having often having a relationship with a person. So they trust you and you can see them over several periods of time to maybe help do that education. I don't have that. You know, I'll do the consultations on the Zeeks. And if the parent doesn't want to believe me, and and they often don't, I mean, and I spend two to three hours with them and so forth and so on, they still don't want to buy it. 
it's, it's you know, we, we both have our issues with getting that done, but it really is important to help the parent understand what's going on with the kid so that they're willing to do what needs to be done. And I would also say that um, you pointed out it's so nuanced in understanding the uh, the fuse, what's lighting the fuse um, for the bomb uh, before the outburst. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would put to you that um, it's so important that it would guide your treatment in a total different direction. For instance, um, kids with ADHD who has out, have outbursts, um, we have found that stimulants are the way to go, like you said, optimizing the ADHD, and then the outbursts generally decrease, um, most half of the time at least, as you said. But if a child has autism and is having outbursts, we have found that really SSRIs might be the first way to go because an autistic child has anxiety with the world, having difficulty understanding, perceiving the world, um, synthesizing stimuli. So often you put them on an SSRI and their aggressive outbursts can decrease as well. But that's not to say stimulants don't work in autistic children. Well, and, and, I, and, and I think I think autistic kids are a, are a particularly complicated bunch to to manage because their outbursts are often <clears throat> a result of frustration. They're a frustr they're frustrated. They can't. Their language skills aren't great. And that rigidity business about you just don't. It comes from left wing. You know what is the kid having a meltdown about? That, you know, the coloring book didn't have the right picture on it or the school bus didn't have the right number on it. I mean, my God. And so I think understanding those things and helping the kid understand them is is really important. I will also say that 80, uh, kids with autism are really sensitive to medication. And so they often um, uh, get quote unquote manic uh, on SSRIs, or they get worse, worse on stimulants. So I think they need, the parents need to be, um, you know, warned about it. None of this stuff is miraculous. We really have a lot of work to do in this area, but, you know, my, I guess my job is to, to, to help us do what we can, the best we can with what we've got, and hope that we get the research to help us some more down the road. <clears throat> The other thing I wanted to say is a lot of times uh, aggressive children are automatically treated with a blunt instrument. And by that, I mean antipsychotics, atypicals. And as pediatricians, we've all seen what that does to our patients. Um, it can ruin their metabolic life. I mean, it can, they gain 20, 30 more pounds sometimes. And uh, the blood tests that have to be done to make sure that they're okay on it. And... Um, there was a big backlash because these drugs were overprescribed for many years. And now we know maybe, you know, in an aggressive kid, try a stimulant first, try to optimize their other problems, try an SSRI, try different things before trying an atypical, but atypicals are still useful to my tool belt, but maybe just not to go to the first. Here's my, here's my response for, for the atypicals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I, I agree with absolutely everything you said almost with any medication, but especially the atypicals, go into it with an exit strategy. You know, one of the things that parents really worry about is, oh my God, he's going to be on drugs for the rest of his life. And I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone the rest of your kid's life. Let's try to get your child as normalized as we can, as happy as the kid can be, so that he gets a normal childhood and you get a, a, a normal child. And then when when we're there, we can talk about let's back off. What life where life becomes dicey, I think, is when we are we start throwing like with Zeke, you start throwing drugs. Oh, this isn't working. Let's add this, let's add this, let's add this. Kids on six different drugs, and you don't know where you are. And so I think that that exit strategy is one of the ways that you can let people know that you're not going to be doing this forever. You're going to try to figure out a way to back out. And in fact, there are some data from the folks that make Risperidone from Janssen that shows at the end of six months that when they randomized kids to placebo or staying on Risperidone, 
yeah, they're, they're the kids on risperidone still were doing a little bit better than the kids on placebo, but there was a significant number of kids on placebo that did fine. So it's not a, um, it's not a, a panacea forever. And, um, but it also doesn't mean that you should never do it. Right. Uh, agree with everything you said also. <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, we don't have the benefit of, of having an audience uh, uh, to ask the questions, but I think we had a nice discussion after. And as you said, any burning questions someone has, can, they can email you on the first slide uh, of your presentation. And uh, I wanna thank you very much for coming. Um, sorry about the technical problems we had in the beginning, but they're behind us now. And I'm sure that many of our uh, members will love to watch this recording. All right, I hope they do it with a bag of popcorn, right? <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right, well, thank you again, Dr. Carlson, and have a good night. Thank you, you too. Bye.